praise the Lord for our worship music today. I especially liked seeing the multi-generational praise team and in the choir, and, and thank you so very much. It was really incredible. <clears throat> this is kind of a part B of a message I brought two or three weeks ago on marriage and the family. I heard about uh, a couple that were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And the wife looks over at her husband and he's just weeping profusely. And, and she looked at him and said, honey, what, what, what's the problem? What, what is, you know, this is a joyous time. What, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, 50 years ago, your daddy held a shotgun to my head. <laughs> and he said, you either marry that girl or you're going to go to jail. And he said, uh, I just realized something that uh, if, 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 if I hadn't said to him I'd do it, I'd be a free man tomorrow. <laughs> Longevity doesn't ensure a happy marriage. Our country, the United States of America, has the dishonor of having the third highest divorce rate of any country in the world. Uh, I think sometimes our uh, country music lyrics describe it about as good as anything. I saw one last week uh, that said, uh, she got the gold mine, I got the shaft. We were married for better or for worse, but not for long. And then there's, of course, the classic, uh, thank God and Greyhound, you're gone. That, that was a very deep, spiritually moving song. Uh, one, one of the things that really, as you know, we're, we're planting churches in the Pacific Northwest. We have about 19 church plants going on there right now. And my first trip up to Portland, we were just riding around doing a windshield survey and maybe doing a little prayer walking at the same time. And we were going through an area called Selwood. And I looked out my window to the right and in the storefront window, was a placard that said, we rent wedding rings. That captured my heart for the Portland area. Changed me forever. Because you and I are living in a time when many people look at their marriage as no big deal. If it doesn't work out, I'll throw it away and start all over again. I uh, called Union County just this week and um, I asked, how many, how many marriages did we have in 2017? There were 977 marriages performed last year in Union County. But at the same time, there were 480 divorces granted right here in our little area of North Carolina. Somebody said it takes uh, four people uh, to pull off a divorce. Now, we have several attorneys that are in the room today. It takes a husband and his attorney. It takes a wife and her attorney, and only two people win. And I'll let you guess who it is that wins. <clears throat> in America, there are approximately one divorce every 36 seconds. That's nearly 2,400 divorces a day. It translates into 16,800 a week and 876,000 a year. And the average marriage length of time before divorce is eight years. But the tragic part is that there are 4,000 kids a day. Now, are y'all listening? 4,000 kids a day witness their mama and their daddy wind up in divorce. I hear statements like, well, we have irreconcilable differences. Statements like, well, I just don't have any feelings for them anymore. Or they don't meet my needs anymore. Well, Pastor, we're just basically um, incompatible people. I, I had one not long ago, pastor, there's been so much hurt and so many harsh words have been spoken that it is irreparable. I'd like to remind all of us here this morning, 
is that when God instituted marriage, which was the very first institution that he ever created, he brought man and woman together to produce holiness within them. And that idea of producing holiness brings about fulfillment in both the husband and the wife, emotional fulfillment, physical fulfillment, sexual fulfillment, social fulfillment in them. Till death do us part, not till debt do us part. Marriage is a three-way covenant. It is a covenant between you and your spouse and with God. And there are two processes in this life that really never ought to be entered into prematurely. Divorce and embalmment. God put men and woman together and man really, no one really has the right to pull apart what God has put together. I want to talk to you this morning about throwing in the towel. Before you throw in the towel in your marriage, there are certain things that need to happen in your life. And I promise you this, if we will do these five things today, the divorce rate in this country would diminish 100%. Hope you got a pen and paper. Let's write it down. Number one, re-examine our relationship with God. Number one, re-examine our relationship with God. Let me say a word to you. It is a fantasy to believe that you can have a successful marital relationship apart from a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, powerful, powerful uh, chapter. Uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul is closing out his second book uh, to the church at Corinth. In verse 5, he says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you? except you be reprobates. So our encouragement here this morning is to test yourself, to let the searchlight of the Holy Spirit of God look deep inside and bring to your mind, am I truly a child of God? Am I truly born again? Has there really been a time in my life that I repented of my sins and placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and my life was radically changed at that moment? Find out if you are a genuine child of God. And if the answer is yes, I am, we are divinely instructed and forbidden to experience divorce. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16, kind of put that back in your mind for a moment. The Bible explicitly says God hates divorce. So how in the world can we say that we love God while at the same time we are making plans to carry out what God says that he hates? It's impossible. If we love God, if we've been blood washed, we cannot say in the same breath that we don't care what God says and vote for what God hates. And one of two things has got to happen. We got to back off from calling ourselves a Christian, or we got to stop filing the divorce papers. First John chapter three and verse number six, the Bible says that really, after you have been born again by the Spirit of God, no one abides in him and keeps on making it a practice of sin. Now, it doesn't say that after you're saved that you will immediately stop sinning. We know that that doesn't happen. We know that we slip up. We know that we make some mistakes from time to time. But when you have divinity living in your heart and in your life, there is a new joy, there is a new desire, there's a new love that we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God and God has planted a new nature inside of us and at that time it becomes impossible for you to keep on practice habitual sin. Doesn't mean you won't slip up. 
just means you won't deliberately, purposefully keep on practicing sin. Uh, Unfortunately today, in our divorce courts, there is no difference in those that claim a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and those that do not know the Lord. So, uh, before we can throw in the towel, there must be a re-examination of ourself with God. Now, I realize what the Word of God does. I realize what the Word of God teaches. The Bible gives us uh, two opportunities for divorce. One is when our spouse abandons us. And the other is through adultery. But ladies and gentlemen, even then, you and I have a higher responsibility and obligation that supersedes our rights and we must stand for the healing of our marriage. Let me give you number two. Review your role as a spouse. Review review your role as a spouse. Uh, I'm convinced, I'm, I'm really convinced of this. Uh, that about 95% of all people that wind up in the divorce court wind up in that divorce situation as a result of one or both of the uh, people in that marriage that refused to live their life in the role that God has set for them. Now, take your Bible and I want you to look with me to the book of Colossians chapter number three. (coughs) Excuse me. Colossians chapter number three. Now, we could do one of two things. We could go in Ephesians five uh, or Colossians three, but I I choose Colossians three simply because it's a little bit shorter and you'll thank me for that uh, over a period of time here this morning. The Bible says in verse 18, Colossians 3, 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit In the Lord. This is God's plan. This is God's purpose. This is God's uh, will, if you will. Now, ladies and wives, listen carefully what I'm about to tell you. He is not talking here about a position of bondage, nor is he talking about a position of servitude. By the way, um, parenthetically, let me tell you when we do things God's way, there is always freedom, not bondage. There's always liberation, not servitude. So he says, you're to submit to your, you say, what does that mean? It means to acknowledge your husband. You are the head of our family. And you say, well, preacher, you don't know my husband. He makes horrible decisions. Well, he decided to marry you, didn't he? So he doesn't always make horrible decisions. All may not be bad. And even if he does make bad decisions, understand God's going to hold him responsible. Nowhere in the word of God, though, is a woman ever required to be subservient in an area that lacks integrity or morality. And if you have a man that is leading into immorality or he is losing character or integrity and trying to drag you with him in that process, God does not hold you responsible and accountable for that in anything that is conflictive with Scripture. But you're to acknowledge him as the head of your house. You you say, preacher, wait a minute. This is the 21st century. Where in the world have you been for the last 50 years? In the Word, in Scripture, listening to the same one yesterday, today, and forever, and his principles are unaltered, no matter what generation may be here. His principles have not been found tried and wanting. They've been found tried and found difficult and jettisoned or thrown away or discarded. I want to talk a minute about the husband's role. Look at verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against 
them. In Ephesians 5, uh, Paul says that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. May I ask just a simple question here this morning of all of the husbands in the room? Has there any husband in this room done that particularly perfect? If you would, would you please stand? Of course, no one is standing. If you did, well, you just identified yourself as a liar and the church is going to exercise church discipline in you. <laughs> Not at all. Nobody's been able to pull that off. But we are to die trying. Understand that Jesus created the church. He's been tender with the church. He provides for the church. He has a purpose for the church. He died for the church. So women are called to live for their husbands and husbands are called to die for their wives. Look over with me a few more pages to 1 Peter chapter number three, if you will. 1 Peter chapter three. And I want you to see verse number seven. This is a tough verse. It's always been a tough verse for me. Watch this in verse seven. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them. That means to live with them. That, that means to figure out how it is that you are to cohabitate with that person. According to knowledge, get to know them, know what their propensities and their tendencies and their strengths and their weaknesses are. That's why that I recommend a, a, a book by Gary Chapman, The Five Love Languages, to help you to get to know your person. Now watch this. Uh, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. This is a tough verse. But ladies and gentlemen, men and women are equal in the sight of God. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither Gentile nor Jew. There's neither male nor female according to the word of God in the sight of God. The, the, but the purpose of God in that relationship is different. Now, to whom much responsibility has been given, men... Much tender care has got to be made. So the Bible is saying to us in this verse, we are to live with our wives with much consideration. Now I know that the reason that a lot of women bail out in their marriage is because the man has not assumed the responsibility that God has given him. They haven't learned to treat their wives as the most prized possession outside their personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They have not learned to treat their wives as the most prized possession that they have ever been given. And I'll say this to you men, you can't do it in the flesh and you will never be able to do that apart from the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You have to have him. So before you throw in the towel on your marriage, wives and husbands, step back and ask yourself a few questions. First, you ought to ask the question, have I fulfilled the role in our relationship that God has assigned to me? Did I do what God expected me to be and to do in that? Now, we, we, we've, got a, we've got a unique way of doing something. We, we have a unique way of monitoring the other person's role a whole lot better than we do our own role. She's not this and he's not that and da-da-da-da-da. But the real question is, how are you doing? Are you fulfilling the role God has given you? I, 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 <laughs> uh, I can't tell you the number of men that have come to me and said, uh, Pastor, you know, my wife is, is just not meeting my needs. D do you think that I, I grab him by the arm and say, will you just take me to her? I'll get her straightened out. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I say to those old boys, well, you need to grow up and you need to get a life. And by the way, it's about time that you cut the strings, the apron strings away from your mama. Hmm? You don't get married for the purpose of the other person meeting your needs. You're married to meet the needs of the other person. Number three. 
Recognize who the real enemy is. Check out your relationship with God. Make sure you're doing the role God wants you to be doing and then recognize who the real enemy is. Here's what happens when I see people going through divorce is that they've gotten their eyes off who the real enemy is. And if you were to ask them, they would say, it's my spouse is the real enemy. They're the culprit. They're the problem. They're, they're the reason for the misery. They're the enemy. No, no, no. They are the victim in this thing. And there is a big difference. In John chapter 10 and verse number 10, the Bible says that the thief has come to destroy and to kill. But Jesus said, I am come to bring you life. We, we need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, who the real enemy is. Satan is the real enemy. And his desire above all desires at the very top of his list to do is to destroy marriages, particularly Christian marriages. The Bible says that he's a Roaring lions seeking whom he may devour, going to and fro up and down the earth, to maim, to destroy, to lacerate, to thrash, to disfigure every Christian marriage he can for obvious reason. Now, the primary purpose of his prowling is to blindside a marriage that believes for a moment that they have a cartridge relationship that when it goes bad or it gets empty just throw it away and I'll get me another one and they've been convinced because of their feelings that that's the best way to handle it and the only way that they're ever going to find a meaningful relationship is to get it someplace else there are five reasons why Satan wants to destroy your marriage by, by the way, let, let me say a word to those of you that may be in your spiritual smugness right now. And you're sitting there, well, he's not talking to me. <laughs> you're only one disagreement. You're only one argument away from being susceptible to the enemy to come in and to destroy your marriage. Five reasons. Number one, to foil the plans of God who created marriage so that he would be glorified and praised through them. Satan wants to kill the glory of God by destroying your marital relationship, which is the most prized of all human institutions that God ever created. Number two, he wants to show the world that Christianity is inconsistent and not cracked up to be what it's supposed to be. And if it really worked, why are the divorce courts so full of marriages? Number three, don't ever think that Satan's motivation is not to be praised and commended for toppling and bringing down God's creation. Number four, he desires to get a foothold of bitterness in your life and in your marriage so that it will be passed on to future generations. Number five, he wants to be recognized that he has more power than God. So what he does is that he destroys marriages because he'll say, hey, look, God created marriage. He built it up, but I come along and I destroyed it and I brought it down. So who has the most power? Let me give you, before you throw in the towel, a fourth reason why. Remember the consequences of divorce. In Numbers chapter 22 and verse 33, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. In Galatians chapter 6, the Bible says, uh, be careful what you sow, for whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. In other words, we live with the consequences of our choices. You see, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. Let me give you five real quick if I could. Consequence number one, it causes you to break a vow. Solomon, the wisest man who's ever lived, 
The, he says, it's better not to make a vow than it is to make a vow and break a vow. Consequence number two, it removes the wife outside and puts her outside the umbrella of protection and makes her susceptible to the darts of the enemy. When you get married, your wife then comes under the umbrella of her husband and her husband is protective of her against the enemy's attacks. And when divorce happened, it leaves her vulnerable to the enemy. Number three, it severely damages a person's testimony and opens them up to all kinds of accusations and ridicule and susceptibilities. Well, they were once in the church and they were serving God and they got divorced and now look where they are now. If that's all right for them, I guess it's all right for me. It destroys the testimony. Number four, I want you to listen very carefully to this one. It increases the likelihood of divorce with your children. Do you know that children of divorced parents are 50% more likely to divorce themselves? Here's a staggering addition to that. If their parents remarry, there's a 90% chance that they are more susceptible to divorce. Number five, the consequences of divorce, it confirms a lack of forgiveness and ratifies a spirit of bitterness between you and your spouse. I've had men come along and, 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 and women too, for that matter of fact, uh, they, they'll come to me, pastor, I, I can get along with my wife a whole lot better now than I did when we were married. Matter of fact, we're good friends and, and, and we're, we, we enjoy being with each other now. We're real good friends. And I said, well, why didn't you stay married? Well, we just couldn't live together. You, you understand why? Because forgiveness was the missing ingredient. In that relationship. Let me give you a good definition of forgiveness. It is releasing the offender from the obligation to pay for their offense. Let me say it again because some of you didn't get that. It is releasing the offender from the obligation of paying for the offense. Well, I can't do that. I, I just don't feel like doing that. Oh, yes, you can. All you've got to do is just get alone with God for a few minutes and let the Holy Ghost show you what God has already forgiven you of in your slimy existence of sin. And once you realize what God's forgiven you of, then we certainly don't have any rights to hold it against anybody else. Number six. Divorce is saying that man's way is a lot better than God's way. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof is death. Number seven, it creates an economic hardship for everybody that's involved. Do you know that the average cost of a divorce in America today is between fifteen dollars and $20,000? You got that laying around anywhere? Consequence of divorce is the acknowledgement that God is limited in what he can do. Number nine, it opens the door for future unbiblical marriage. Do you know that, that an old boy, when, um, when divorce happens, uh, in about seven months, uh, he gets so out of shape that in about seven months, he's ready to tie the knot again. Number 10, and I'll stop with this one, it brings bitter loneliness that usually leads to further and deeper sin. Now let me give you the last one if I can. That doesn't mean I'm finished, but let, let me give you the last one. It, before you throw in the towel, reaffirm God's power. 
Jeremiah chapter 32 asks an amazing question. Is there anything too hard for God? And the resounding result, if God created this universe out there, there is nothing impossible with him. Do you remember when Mary was encountered by the angel and she said, how in the world is this going to happen? This can't be. And, and, and the angel looks at Mary. God, God, there's nothing impossible with God. Let, let me just tell you, friend, if God can part the Red Sea for the nation of Israel to walk on dry ground, if God can part the Jordan River for his people to come out of the wilderness in the promised land, if God can shut the mouths of the lions in the den to protect old Daniel, if God can get in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if God can bring forth himself out of the womb of a virgin, if God can and raise Lazarus from the dead, if God can enable Peter to walk on water, if God can raise Jesus up on that third day, then God can certainly heal your marriage. Four questions need to ask before divorce. Number one, do I have God's approval? And once you answer that question, you don't even need to ask the other four. Second, do, do I have the spiritual leaders in my life approval? Third, do I have the approval of my own conscience? Fourth, do I have the approval of my friends who love Jesus and they love me enough to tell me the truth? I have a friend that I've had for over 30 years. He's about 80 years old right now, and he's dying with uh, advanced dementia. Uh, pastor and grew a great church. He went out on a day of prayer and fasting and took a pen and paper with him and uh, just was praying to the Lord, and the Holy Ghost gave him these words. I am standing for the healing of my marriage. I'll not give up, give in, give out, or give over till that healing takes place. I made a vow, I said the words, I gave the pledge, I gave a ring, I took a ring. I gave myself, I trusted God and said the words and meant the words in sickness and in health and sorrow and in joy for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in good times and in bad. So I'm standing now and will not sit down, let down, slow down, calm down, fall down, look down or be down till the breakdown is torn down. I refuse to put my eyes on outward circumstances or listen to prophets of doom or buy into what is trendy, worldly, popular, convenient, easy, quick, thrifty, or advantageous. Nor will I settle for a cheap imitation of God's real thing. Nor will I seek to lower God's standard, twist God's will, rewrite God's word, violate God's covenant, or accept what God hates, namely divorce. In a world of filth, I will stay pure. Surrounded by lies, I'll speak the truth. Where hopelessness abounds, I will hope in God. Where revenge is easier, I will bless instead of curse. And where the odds are stacked against me, I will trust in God's faithfulness. I am a stander, and I will not acquiesce, compromise, quarrel, or quit. I've made the choice, set my face, entered the race, believed the word, and trusted God for all the outcome. I will allow neither the reaction of my spouse nor the urging of my friends, nor the advice of my loved ones, nor economic hardship, nor the prompting of the devil to make me let up, slow up, blow up, or give up till my marriage is healed up. I am standing for the healing of my marriage. I'd like to ask you if you would to please stand with me right now for just a moment. Uh, Trey is coming to begin to play something softly. Um, those of you in the balcony and here on this main floor, I, I want to ask you to do something today. Maybe you're here, you, you, your husband's not with you. Maybe your wife is not present with you today. But I'm going to ask you marriages. Some of you may be in deep trouble. But I wonder how many of you would take each other by the hand and 
make your way right here and just stand right here at this altar with me. And by doing so, I'm not going to throw in the towel, preacher. I'm going to stand for the healing of my marriage. And I know who the real enemy is. My husband's not the enemy. My wife's not the enemy. And I'm going to stand and keep the vows that I made before God. Would you come right now and just stand here at the front? And I want to have a time in just a minute just to pray over you as you come. Husbands, wives, all over the building. Many of you coming out of the balcony right now. Just slip out. Come on and just come stand right here around the front. stand pastor I'm going to stand pastor storms raging battles tough but I'm going to stand I'm going to trust God I'm going to be the man in my home that I am supposed to be I'm going to be the woman in my home that I'm supposed to be I, I'm going to fulfill the role that God has destined for me in my life Will you come? Others, come quickly, quickly. Anybody else? I want to pray for you, with you, and over you right now. Church, reach out and let's pray for these families. I suspect that there are a lot of couples, for whatever reason, didn't come that needed to come. still time for you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the wooing, convicting power of taking the word and applying it to lives that are here at this front right now. And I pray, God, that we would stay focused so keenly on you that, God, we would never, ever get to looking at our spouse as an adversary. But God, we would brand this in our minds today that we have a sinister enemy, God, who is seeking to destroy our marriages. And God, how I pray in the name of Jesus today that we would keenly do battle against him and not each other. And God, I pray that we would not yield to the temptation to throw in the towel and to quit and to give up on that which you have put together. And God, that we would learn to love that which you love and hate that which you hate. And that God, we would not make any plans that would be contrary to the teaching, the power, the validity, and the truth of your word. God, if there's a husband that's lost and needs to be saved, God, show him right now. If there's a wife that God has never surrendered to you, does not have you living in her heart and life, God, save her today before they leave this building. And God, I'm praying that you would take these marriages, take these homes and turn them around and may they be a shining example of the difference that you make in a couple who will dare to stand when all else is failing. I pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.